Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Kuhn. I'm Dean of the Honors College. We're very excited that you will join us virtually tonight on this grim and dark age evening to be enthralled by the latest interdisciplinary wizardry on the intersectionality between the Department of Mathematics and the School of Art and also the Faye Jones School of Ar Architecture and Design. So what I'm gonna do up front is explain the rules of the evening. And then I'm going to turn, uh, turn it over to the Dean of the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences, my colleague, Todd Shield, who will introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Edmund Harris. So before we get going, I'd like to thank the Honors College crew that's here and Heidi Bugarin, who's the commander in chief behind the scenes. And we have four amazing Honors College ambassadors who are gonna be womaning the Q&A section. And that's Claire Lakin, Chris Lee, Nicole Hooten, and Rachel Baltz. So if y'all wanna give a good wave. All right, woo! So how we're gonna do this after Dean Shields introduces our distinguished lecturer, uh, he's, Edmund's gonna speak. Now, if you have questions in the middle, he's very laid back and cool. You can put them in the uh, chat and our Honors College ambassadors are gonna be monitoring the chat. And then at the end, when we have the Q&A section, uh, Edmund is happy to take whatever delivery mode that you feel comfortable, whether that's coming on camera and speaking uh, to an unmuted mic, or if you wanna go ahead and pose your questions in the chat and our intrepid Honors College ambassadors will read the questions. And tonight's presentation is our annual fall Honors College mic, in which we bring top talent on campus in front of a community at large audience. So that having been said, I'm gonna turn over the host to my colleague, the Dean of the largest college on campus with 19 departments and 40 plus interdisciplinary programs and he's still standing, uh, a professor of political science with a distinguished research career, and certainly a dean who has supported intersectional work in Fulbright College, but also cross-college disciplinary work. So let's give a big virtual wave and a hoot to Dean Todd Shields. Woo! I'll wave back to you. Thank you, Dean Kuhn, I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the most interdisciplinary scholars that we have in the college, uh, Dr. Edmund Harris. He received his PhD in mathematics from Imperial College London. He's a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics here at the University of Arkansas. Last fall, Dr. Harris participated in a semester long symposium on mathematics and art hosted by the Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics at Brown University. There he worked with mathematicians and artists, exploring the connections between math and art in new media. He has partnered with Alex Bellos, an acclaimed science writer and columnist for The Guardian, to produce two coloring books of dizzyingly beautiful geometric pattern. He is the author, co-author of over a dozen articles in both science and mathematics journals, six book chapters and other publications, as well as a blog called Maxwell's Demon, Vain Attempts to Construct Order. He's also publishing a children's book titled Hello Numbers, What Can You Do? Co-authored with Houston Hughes and illustrated by New York Times artist, Brian Rhea. Dr. Harris, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for being here uh, and for this opportunity to talk about the, uh, the joy of mathematics. Um, and it's always nice to get an, a, a large audience to, to think about mathematics from that point of view. Um, the delight and wonder that as mathematicians, we often get from the subject is not always mirrored uh, in our students or people in schools studying the subject. So I hope to bring some mathematical delight and enjoyment to the, uh, the events this evening. And actually, I want to start with that notion of being in school, because uh, both art and mathematics have the same question asked about them. What is the point of this? 
And it comes from very different points of view for the two subjects. But what I want to present tonight is a question, um, an answer, sorry, not a question, an answer to that question uh, that actually I think works for both those subjects. I don't think it is the only answer. There are many other ways to justify that. But I think I want to think about the way that both art and mathematics help us to perceive and understand the world in more detail. And that is something that I think is an ancient tradition. And so making pattern goes back to the, the beginning of human endeavor. Um, and so over my shoulder here, I have a piece of tapa cloth made in Fiji. Um, it was made in the 1990s when I had the fortune to, to be there, but using techniques that went back uh, thousands of years. Uh, and it is a, a method of printing where you create some motif and then you repeat and that pattern grows out. And these notions of patterns um, are just across all cultures. So another example um, comes from Iceland. And here I have this marvelous book. So I need to move down and remember to put it upside down. There we go. So this is a wonderful book that was put together of all the traditional knitting patterns uh, in the, the sort of canon of Icelandic um, craft. And again, you see in here, these sort of repeating patterns, some motif that can be repeated and comes on top of itself in many different ways. And they can either be sort of lined up patterns producing what we call freeze patterns or full repeating patterns that go out in both directions. And this is a tradition that is continued because I have here uh, cushions that my mother made through cross-stitch. Uh, my mother was actually one of the fir my first mathematical mentors, uh, introduced me to the joys of the subject. Uh, she was a mathematics teacher for her whole life. And these are made with those patterns. And so this is where art and mathematics are coming together as, to a certain extent, the same subject. People are using these repeating units and exploring how they go. They're doing it to make art, but they are using abstract mathematical ideas. Today, we would talk about the notions of symmetry that are involved. And in that Icelandic pattern book, we can now say that in those freeze patterns, those strips, all the possible symmetry patterns are represented. And now it's time to move. And I have to start my, I'm sorry, didn't get fully prepared. Here we go. Share screen. So, and here are the patterns that I was, or a collection of patterns that I was making, uh, mentioning. So each of these possible each of these strips has a different symmetry or set of symmetries to it. And these are all the seven possible ones. And today, mathematically, we can analyze that and, and do a bunch of abstract work to show how these, the symmetries work abstractly. But the, that pattern work was being done 
in Iceland hundreds of years ago. And another way that abstract thinking became important to perceive and understand the world is in navigation. And this is an image of uh, Icelandic spa, which is quite possibly what is described by the Vikings as a sunstone. So in a cloudy environment over on the ocean, sailing between Iceland and Scandinavia, that, that's too long a distance to be uh, able to always just go from coast to coast. And so you need to be able to navigate. And this stone uh, has a polarizing effect as do the clouds that the sun comes through. And so even if you can't see the sun, you can identify the direction that the sun is in. But you can't do that directly. You have to understand how the sun polarizes the light. And so you're not just holding the stone up and getting it to point to north, or you, know, you firstly have to understand the time of day, which will give you the direction of the sun. From the, that, you can then also use the way that the sun polarizes the light and this stone to understand the direction the sun is in, and so the direction you are heading. So it's not that direct connection. You have to use some, some abstract ideas to get the understanding of the world you wish to, to get. Uh, in this case, the understanding of the world, the thing you're perceiving, is simply the orientation of your boat on the sea. And navigation is also something that the Pacific Islanders worked really hard and well at. Um, and so these are two uh, woven charts. And when they were entered into the British Museum logs, they were, they were deemed to be decorative um, charts. Uh, I, I think the one on the right you might think of as decorative, but the one on the left, as a decorative object, to be honest, looks a bit of a mess. Is that really uh, something that you would think of as decoration? And it turns out that neither of these are decorative. What these are, are wave patterns. They are showing the refraction patterns that waves make as they move around islands. And the one on the right is a training pattern or a pattern to look at the, the, the shape waves make, you can see a shell at either on the right and left of it. When you have a gap between islands, the waves will be refracted through that gap and they will make patterns similar to those placed into this. And that is useful because when you're sailing around the, the Pacific, you need to be able to find land. And using this sort of technique allows you to find land at far greater distance than you can just by, by sight, it's well beyond the horizon. And on the left is a copy of the wave patterns that you can see around an archipelago. So you can see a bunch of different shells representing islands. And this gives you a sense of what the different patterns of waves that would be um, seen. And the, so these charts represent something abstractly. They represent the shapes of waves, but not exactly. They represent some aspect of that um, thinking. And um, an interesting question might be, if this was the beginning of your abstract understanding as opposed to the tradition that we're more used to, which comes from geometry uh, and building pyramids, what sort of mathematics would we have built first? Um, you can make a case, it's complete counterfactual, so everything becomes um, theoretical anyway, but you could make a case that actually calculus might be a more fundamental thought it would be a tool that you would need to use in more detail in the sort of dynamic environments where you're thinking about waves as opposed to the fixed structures that geometry um, gives us in mathematics. And what we've seen so far is that you know, from the North Atlantic to the South Pacific, both pattern and perception through mathematics 
is this universal human tradition. Um, and we are used to the mathematics of a particular tradition of uh, that, that, that follows, particularly since the development of calculus in Western Europe. But these sorts of thinkings, the, the use of mathematics as a system to help understand, participate in our world is something that's completely broad. It's, it's across all humans, not just that one tradition that we, we most identify today. And so now I want to come a bit closer to home. And this is a walnut grove uh, north of Fayetteville. And the photo you're seeing is by Tim Hursley of a, an art piece I made with Carl Smith and Angela Carpenter, um, who are both in uh, Faye Jones School of Architecture. And the key idea to think about for this piece comes from the mathematical tool of the grid. So we, in, to start this piece, we used a, a notion of perceptualism. We went into the orchard and without any preconceived notions, and we saw, we, we tried to work out what were our experiences? How could we analyze those experiences? And for me, the orchard being planted on a grid immediately evoked this mathematical tool. The notion of a grid is a powerful mathematical tool. And so here is one of the sketches I made after that first experience. These are dots plant placed on the same grid that the trees in the orchard are placed on. That's why it's not the more familiar square grid. And they, um, and you can see on the right, this, this is the set of dots you would see if you were standing at the big dot in the middle. Because if you're on a grid and you look in one direction, you look at one dot, all the dots behind it get hidden. Now, this is a top-down view of dots, which is very different from that three-dimensional orchard. But the trees are playing the role in some sense of these, these dots. And so for me, thinking about this sort of pattern and the sort of patterns you see within it, uh, both this observation pattern on the right and just the lines you can see moving through a, a, a grid, the different tunnels that get produced, not just the obvious tunnels, sort of the vertical and diagonal ones, but these more complicated diagonals. They were all things that I really perceived and felt strongly in that first experience. So the notion of a grid is a very powerful one. Oh, too much animation in one place. Um, so perspective is another mathematical tool today, but it's a tool that actually came from art. Perspective is a way of very directly perceiving the world that was developed by artists to be able to, to paint accurate three-dimensional images. And from these two paintings, you see the difference between, in some sense, art before perspective and art after perspective. So these are both paintings of St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, it's actually paintings of different St. Paul's cathedrals because in the middle of this, St. Paul's burnt down. But on the left, you see the old St. Paul's Cathedral. And on the right, you see Christopher Wren's masterpiece. And you can see on the right, that image pulls us into a three-dimensional scene. We can see the depth. We can see the cathedral there behind the river. Whereas on the left, the image becomes flat. You can see that it's sort of meant to be three-dimensional, but it's not working. The different pieces are not working together. And so you're not combining the understanding that was developed in perspective of how our eyes perceive the world. That structure 
is something that comes from art, but is also now, you know, today it's a topic of great interest in mathematics. Um, we would normally talk about projective geometry rather than perspective, but that's something that grow, grows directly out of the artist's developing perspective. And so this is, a this is probably the strongest example of how mathematics as a system of structures and a perception of the world come together to enable us to do things that maybe one or other of those systems wouldn't be able to, to do alone. And so here is what happens when we mix these two tools. On the one hand, we have a grid. On the other hand, we have perspective. So what happens when we put a grid into perspective? So here is our eye looking out and we're seeing all these dots, but we don't, we, we see the dots sort of by their, their angle. So when we look out, the dots are regular here in two dimensions, but we see a sort of dense collection here from our point of view, things spread out below and then things lined up above. And when we take a viewpoint like this um, and use it to create an image of a orchard, we get this picture. This is sometimes called the orchard illusion. So we've just taken a grid of rectangles, but using the rules of perspective, we're spreading them out and scaling them. And you get this very strong image of depth. This is the, the sort of image I was thinking about in that orchard, even though this is a very, you know, this is just a bunch of rectangles. It's a very, very simple image taking on something that existed in that complex, beautiful, natural space. And if we go from a sort of two dimensional grid to a three dimensional grid and look at a projective image of that, we get this. So all we are doing here is combining that notion of perspective, linking it to projective geometry and the notion of a grid and bringing them together and combining those two things, we, we, we create this, this fascinating image that, that reveals all sorts of sort of hidden detail and, and structure. So all these ideas were sort of out there in my thinking um, as I was looking at the, the orchard. And coming back to the work, we wanted, so you've seen both these photographs. The, the orchard is so stunningly beautiful. You're, you can't try and compete as an artist with that natural beauty. You, you know, if you, if you try to, you're going to fail. You know, it's a wonderful act of hubris. But instead, what we wanted to do was take some of the ideas and feelings and perceptions that we had had in that space and work out how to help create the experience in other people who were seeing that space, either in these beautiful photographs of Tim Hursley um, or the people who are able to come out and see the sculpture while it was installed. And what you see is this tree here is the central tree. And every, well, several of the trees around it have these domes. And the domes look very sort of dense when you're looking at them from the side, but at the point you're lined up to point at that central tree, they disappear because they become just these vertical struts. And you're look at left looking at, out at a row of trees disappearing into the distance from, from where you are. And so this is bringing the ideas and the abstract thought we had about the general notions of perspective and grids and placing the, that back in the, the context of the, the space that um, we were experiencing. And I 
love this uh, misquote of Paul Clay that um, Peter Lowe uh, said to me, which was art is not to render the visible, but to render visible. To take the things that you, someone can perceive and make them visible to many people. And to me, this sums up as big part of what we were trying to do in the Orchard project. We were trying to take those experiences that we had had and bring them out into something that could be visible to many people. And I think there's a sort of fundamental model that I, I want to sort of think about for, this, the, for, for the remainder of this talk, built off what we did here. You have something in the world, you pull that into a mental model. Um, as the uh, actor and activist Bembo Davis says, I like to take things into metaphor and shake them up a bit to see what falls out. You take that mental model, you then take your discoveries from that model and place them back into the world of physical action. You act on the world and that then affects the world back. And so this is the sort of central loop. You, know, you could describe this as some sort of central loop of life. You exist in the world, you experience that, that experience causes you to act in certain ways that changes the world. And as you go around the loop, you understand hopefully slowly more thinks about what is what's happening. So this brings me to Rhode Island in the fall last year, when I had the great fortune to be at the semester on illustrating mathematics with a large collection of mathematicians and artists in the Mathematics Research Center, ISEM. And you can see here some of the many illustrations of mathematics that were being produced during that semester, the variety of forms and ideas that were being um, created in order to, to explore and make mathematics accessible and visible. And if you like that, the story of the Walnut Grove is thinking about how my mathematical understanding can serve an art project. And this is the reverse. This is asking how notions of creativity and making objects and illustration can serve an understanding of, of mathematics. And a powerful example of that are these renderings that come from virtual reality world. So you could actually put on a headset and instead of just watching a fixed animation, you could look around. And these are geometries uh, that were discovered um, in the last hundred years, well, a little bit more than a hundred years. So the dodecahedral space was discovered in, towards the end of the 19th century. Nil and Sol were discovered in the middle of the 20th century. And we can now use technology to actually explore those spaces and ask what would they look like? If I was in this geometry, what would space look like as I looked out and moved uh, around it? But the story I want to tell from that semester actually starts with this image. And this is the image of roots of a polynomial. Not a polynomial, roots of all quadratic polynomials that have quadratic roots. So everyone who has um, struggled through learning the correct rhyme uh, for minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Um, this is the result of doing that on a large range of different numbers. So it's, it seems to be an object from algebra, from a mechanical solving of equations, 
but it also might look a little bit familiar. Doesn't this look a little bit like that perspective grid image that we saw earlier? And that's exactly what I thought when I saw this image presented in ISOM by my colleague, Kate Stang. I thought it was you know, one, a really beautiful image, but also something that reminded me of the, that perspective grid. And so I wanted to explore further. And so it's worth bringing up here, you know, a really powerful tool of mathematics is the notion of solving equations. So this is where you have something you don't know, you process it in some way, and then you do know what you get out after that process. So an equation like x squared minus x plus one, that does something to x. And I, if I know that I get zero out when I apply that process, I could ask, well, what could X have been if the output is going to be correct? And mathematics is a way of sort of reversing those processes. And, and what we're using here is an additional mathematical tool, which is just doing everything um, for limited values of everything. So instead of just solving one equation in that previous picture, we were going ahead and solving every equation of a certain form and seeing what happened for all of them. And we could see structure by looking at everything that we couldn't see by just looking at individual points. And if you want to solve equations, quadratic equations, as was shown in the previous picture, are a very simple example from the point of view of mathematics but they, are, they exist as the simplest example of a sort of hierarchy. And our question was, if this lovely picture exists for quadratics, what about for those higher things? Um, things called cubics and quartics and quintics and sextics, all describing the number of times you're allowed to multiply something before you, uh, it, in the system of equa in the equation. And we did we started to find pictures like this. And this is just a small sample of the pictures we found. And again, you're seeing that delightful perspective structure, but now instead of being built on straight lines or arcs of circles, as you saw for the uh, quadratics, the curves start to get more and more complicated. And so we asked the, the question, uh, you know, what can we what can we do with this? And this is where we were so fortunate to be in it in a, a system like the, the semester at ISO. And we had the time just to say, okay, let this is this is this needs to be explored for the sake of the fact that these pictures look attractive. These pictures are interesting. Let's spend the time to study them. And can we see the ideas that we were uh, linking? like a perspective grid, do they really turn up here? And uh, for, for the mathematicians in the audience, the, the link is actually pretty direct. Um, you can think of a, the, the grid of polynomials, that makes a very nice lattice. I can then think of a, the cone of a negative determinant project that onto a disk. And if I then convert from that disk as the Klein model of the hyperbolic plane to the upper half plane model, I have just solved all those quadratics. Um, so uh, uh, the rest of the audience who didn't follow that, uh, don't worry, that was a lot of jargon. Um, some beautiful concepts there. I wish more people would understand things like hyperbolic geometry that I mentioned in there. But the basic idea, I think, in saying that is that for a mathematician, I just gave enough information to recreate something that links this roots of polynomials to the perspective grid you saw before. And whilst it might have sounded a bit long-winded and introduced panicky thoughts from, from high school, it wasn't that long. I didn't have to talk for very long to explain that idea. And I think that's 
that's a, a, a key notion that the mathematics is able to express these things. And we were able to find quite a simple way that the ideas that we were seeing actually did really fit into the structures we were, we were studying. Um, and this is now stepping up to a, a larger collection of polynomials. And you, you can see that there's a lot of structure here, but it's more in a sort of Jackson Pollock effect. Uh, this does not look like a very, very tightly defined geometric image to me. It, it looks sort of almost exuberant. And, um, but you can see that there is, there is a lot of structure that we're still seeing in that space. So this large dot here, which happens to be the root of a particular polynomial, is, has these sort of spirals coming into it from different directions. And we, we have spirals coming in to all the large dots. And as, the, as you're, you allow more dots to be perceived as large, you can still see spirals coming, coming into them. Um, and here is a similar image um, of a different sort of polynomial. And again, there seems to be a lot of structure here, but there's a question of what is that structure? And the answer is we're not sure. We don't know. We, we have got this new lens to look at this old problem of mathematics, understanding the structure, of algebraic numbers. And we want to be able to, to find reasons for some of the structure we're seeing here and think about how we can get understanding from that. And there are some ways in which this, this work is already starting to explain some, some mathematical results. So here, we have um, the gray points and the blue, there's two colors of blue points. And what we're trying to do is think about what are the gray points that best approximate or best close to the blue points. Um, now, if you were to plot all the gray points we are wanting, they would be everywhere. We would say this was dense, so you would, if you zoomed in, you'd still see lots and lots of points. And the more you zoomed in, the more points you would see. Um, but you want to approximate not with just any of these points, but the ones that we define to be simple. And our notion of simple is here encoded in how large a dot is. So a larger dot is simpler than a smaller dot. That's the, the motivation. And you can see here that this dot, which is off, comes from here, and is off one of those obvious curves we saw in the, that quadratic picture. This is not as well approximated as this dot, which lies on that curve. And this was a, uh, you know, a very technical mathematics paper came up with these mysterious conditions as to when I could approximate. So the blue points are quartic complex numbers and the gray points to quadratic, when I could approximate quartic numbers by quadratics. But it was sort of this, these slightly strange conditions. Well, those conditions are precisely, am I on one of these curves or not? And you can see the the points, the gray points are really clustering along these curves. And so of course I'm going to approximate something on one of those curves better because there's more, more stuff happening there. And so you get this picture that shows the technical mathematics and reveals that it, it makes sense. I'm now going to switch back to my camera. Um, and do the shameless bit of my talk. <laughs> 
So I brought out the counting book that I've been working on because I've just talked about playing with mathematics and a bunch of mathematicians doing that in the rarefied air of a, a beautiful research center high above Providence where uh, you know, we had these wonderful views out from the, the, everyone's office. That is definitely a space where people have earned the right to play with mathematics by getting through all the hard, nasty stuff. And it's something that when I talk about joy and play in mathematics to teachers, the answer I get is often, well, joy and play is great, but people have to master something first. And too often, something is the level above whatever level that teacher taught, taught, teaches at. So elementary teachers might say, yes, you can, you can play with mathematics, but first you have to master arithmetic. In high school, it might be algebra or calculus. At some point, play in mathematics is always for later after you've mastered things. And I think that's a fundamental mistake because I think the way to learn and understand and play with these systems, it, I've said it inadvertently, we need to play with these systems. And so one of my motivations behind the book, and I apologize for the shameless plug, was we, you can start playing with mathematics in fact, with dot patterns, you don't need to know about quartic numbers. You can just know a little bit about counting. As soon as you know something about counting, you can start to play with mathematics to experiment and create. And often what you experiment and create will be the uh, ideas that will be the next level of mathematics or a different piece of mathematics. You'll be playing, you know, we were playing, I was playing around with perspective and grids and I end up learning something that was useful in algebra. The play with mathematics takes one piece of mathematics and links it into all sorts of other pieces. And art is the system which is most, uh, acknowledging and thinking about that notion of exploration just for the, the sake of it. And this is where somewhere where I feel like, you know, creative mathematicians are more like artists than they are like, like scientists. But in the 20th century, our mathematical thinking got a huge ally connected to it, the computer. And I want to present this little piece of wood. So I've talked about that process as this sort of abstract human thing where we look at the world, we understand the world in some way, and then we act on the world. Well, with computers, we can automate some aspects of that process. So let's keep this in sight. How is this made? Well, I took a photograph of the grain of the wood. I then took that photograph into some software I wrote, which identified what the curves of the, where the curves of the grain were, or more precisely, just locally. It didn't actually draw the whole curve, just the, the direction that the grain was pointing in loops at any point. And then it started at the center and started to draw lines out. So on top of the grain of the wood, it created this pattern and the curves in that pattern always moved at right angles to the grain. So this is a very mathematical process. I'm writing an algorithm. I'm using notions from multivariate calculus in order to find the gradient. I've noticed that some of my students from that course are here, so uh, this is your chance to see the gradient in action. And then I make these curves follow that gradient. So there's a lot of mathematics happening here, but there's also the notion of craft because 
the reason I wanted to make this, well, what I was trying to do with this piece was not use mathematics. I was wanting to create a surface effect where the wood really had sort of steep vertical cuts. So the, what, you didn't have a nice smooth jump from one cut to the next. And from a craft point of view, if you've ever pushed a router through wood, you know that in the direction of the grain, at right angles to the, the grain, the wood is cut far better. The, the cut is cleaner. And so I was using an, a craft understanding of the behavior of a router through wood in order to create the effect of these, these level, different level cuts. So I took the photo, I created this set of parts which were gonna work well into the wood. And then I placed the wood into a CNC machine And sadly, I don't have video of the piece that I'm showing being cut, but here is a similar machine. And so this machine automatically moves this router along a path that you can program. And if you can program the path on a computer, then you can make the computer move along that path. And so I'm able to go from an idea that takes into account craft-based ideas of how you want to cut wood and move from there into a system where I use an algorithm to create the right structures to cut a piece of, of wood. And that is taking this, this loop that we've been talking about and making it into a, adding a certain level of, of automation. And this is, um, this was from the, that, that point of view of trying to create an interesting image in a piece of, of wood. Uh, but here I have the idea of using those sorts of ideas to create a mathematical object. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, Sylviana Amethyst. And she worked on the mathematical surface. I worked on controlling the machine to cut these individual pieces. This is a surface called uh, the Bath Sextic. And it is um, a, it's again, the solution to a polynomial, but now a polynomial in three uh, variables in three dimensional space. So it ends up being a, a surface. And so each of these units um, was made individually and then they were connected together. And oh, I'm sure I put the volume on this down, but here we have a different CNC machine carving one of these pieces. And the path that's moving along is the path that uh, Silviana designed onto this surface. And that and the mathematical object is actually helping us create that path. So the, the path itself relates to the structure of the um, surface. And the furthermore, the direction that the tool is pointing in is given by that surface. So from a point in that surface, we can know not just where it is, but also how the surface behaves locally. That is exactly a process of calculus. And we use that to find this normal direction. And so the tool is moving quite in quite big jumps over the surface, but it's always staying at right angles. So the flat end of the, the tool produces a really nice surface, uh, really nice finish on the, the surface. 
And I could talk for hours about the, uh, the mathematics of that five axis machine and how that itself is a beautiful example of perceiving the world through mathematics. But let's put this back because uh, Dr. Kuhn would not speak to me again if I didn't introduce uh, the lovely ball that she has outside the Honours College. And this is, so this is a sculpture that I made and it's made of metal. And if any of you have ever done anything with sheet metal and trying to bend it, you'll know that getting smooth bends into metal is a really hard technical challenge. There are a bunch of different tools and it's a real skill to master. Um, and I have spent no time mastering any of those skills, yet I was still able to, to make this as a slightly clumsy English mathematician. And the reason, but I think the result, this feels like a really spherical object. It feels like these bends are really nice and smooth. And this itself comes from the way that I was making this, this sculpture. And that didn't come, as I said, didn't come from my mastery of, of craft. It actually came from understanding of geometry and the, uh, something called the Gauss-Binet theorem. So that is a theorem that even many math majors do not see. But it relates how much you turn as you go around a loop to how much the surface within that loop is curved. And so these, these pieces start off as, as flat with these angles. And then in order to connect them up, I have to push the ends together. And by thinking about that as turning on a surface, it distributed the bending smoothly over each unit. Now this was the second one I made and the first one um, to get the final piece in required three people, half a dozen clamps and a lot of swearing. This second one I made, actually one of the easiest connections in the whole piece was putting together the final connection. Um, because everything, we've been very gentle with it, we'd let the metal and the geometry guide us rather than trying to force anything. And what are we perceiving here? Well, for one thing, I'm, I was definitely, when I was bending these pieces of metal together, I was physically perceiving that abstract mathematical result of, of, of Gauss. And on the other hand, the mathematics allow us, allows us to perceive something that allows a hand-bent sculpture to have smooth curves by following an understanding of the nature of the geometry of, of surfaces. And here is the resulting sculpture uh, with its beautiful lime green powder coating. And I couldn't not put in uh, some video of Emily Baker's uh, plasma cutter, and this is cutting those pieces that you were seeing. This is actually, it's cutting, if you look carefully, the holes for the bolts to go through. Um, so again, we take our path that we want to cut and we tell a machine to do it. And you go from the abstract world of drawing something on a computer to the physical world of having a sheet of metal cut to the shape you designed in your hands. And this understanding came from this system that I played with not initially in metal, but, but in mylar. Um, this is a system I created called curvahedra. And it has the, uh, you are using these sheets and you can again have the effect of bending. Um, and so I knew how this system worked quite well um, before I put the investment in to use a plasma cutter to cut through the, the metal uh, and get those expensive sheet metal parts. And because you can create in metal any shape that you can draw, but it's not necessarily going to do what you expect after you've brought it into um, reality. Um, 
And as a uh, teaser, here is uh, Dean Kuhn with uh, one of the pieces of a sculpture that hopefully will be appearing very soon in the courtyard of Gerhardt Hall. This is a scale model uh, of it. But, and then again, that is something where we're using mathematical ideas to uh, be able to create interesting form in sheet metal. And the nice thing about this ability to smoothly turn abstract ideas into reality is it, it does enable the creation of all sorts of crazy and whimsical ideas. Um, and I wanted to mention this awesome project that I've been very fortunate to be part of called uh, Mathem Alchemy, which is a group of people creating a big math diorama. It's a group of mathematicians and artists uh, le led by uh, Dominique Erdmann, who is an artist, and Ingrid Debushi, who is a mathematician. And this was a poster that we had at the memorial for John Conway, who sadly died earlier this year. Um, and many people, if you know about John, you might know about his office, which was this crazy world of mathematical objects. Um, and so one of the items in this big scene that we're creating is a uh, shop uh, selling crazy mathematical items. Um, and uh, so, uh, and well, the, the tools and understanding of the tools enabled, again, this some maker experience mathematician to actually build this object using those things, uh, those ideas of, of CNC and taking ideas into reality. Um, which would be well beyond my skill level without being able to use those, those abstract ideas. So we're now in the last few minutes and I guess the, the math joy now needs to take a slight step aside because this fact that we can take in data process it and then act on the world seems really nice when it's making mathematical whimsical sculpture. But we also see that sort of thing happening in social media in the algorithms of Facebook and what information you're presented on these forums in high frequency trading in uh, the stock market. And a, a great resource to, to understand about the, the issues and problems that are inherent in, in those systems. As these things get automated, are they going to do what we expect? It's, it's not carving a path into a piece of wood where if it happens to go wrong somewhere in the algorithm, the problem is you break a, a, a bit. It is about the, these fundamental aspects of society. And this is where I think art and mathematics come together are our key because it's not just about understanding the technical aspects of what is going on. It's also about understanding the, the human and societal elements. So not just art and mathematics, all the expertise in some sense of the university needs to be able to work across boundaries to understand because we've got these very technical algorithms. We need the people who can address and think about those at very, very subtle levels. That is something that, that comes as much in mathematics as anything else. But then you need to be able to understand and communicate the effects of those, those things. And that is where expertise from the technical subjects is not always the, the best. It's not always the thing that's gonna help you get through. And this is true, this notion that we need to understand data and understand questions comes in so many of the great challenges that we are facing right now. Your global warming is a, a, a fascinating example. We have to trust and understand models that predict what's going to happen and understand that they have strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes they might predict one thing and it's not quite the, the right thing, but understand, you know, 
predicting the future is always going to be hard, but we can understand that fundamentally something is happening by, by looking at the, the data. And as I was writing this, uh, this talk over the summer, we were dominated by two issues that where, where both seeing data and then uh, being able to act intelligently and, and process it were, were key. Early in any pandemic, the amount of possible paths forward are vast. You really have to look at the data and react reasonably, knowing that you might be acting in the wrong way as more data comes in. Now, we now have a lot more data about what, what, what is happening, but especially early on, we were facing the requirement of people to understand exponential growth, for example. And, but another example uh, where, where data seems to come in and, and, and play a role is the question of Black Lives Matter and the protests around George Floyd over the summer. And here, it almost feels like the problem is not so much whether or not the data is good, it's whether or not people want to hear it. Um, and so instead of addressing that directly, which would be a, a whole talk in its own right, I want to finish just by giving an example of something I feel is a beautiful melding of mathematics and art to communicate. And that is shown in this amazing book. Um, this is a book of the images that W.E.B. Du Bois made for the Paris exhibition in 1900. And the artwork you can see on this page, the range of amazing images that they have created communicating the experience of black lives at the turn of the century, well, the previous turn of the century in America. And the, this was groundbreaking. The, it was created by an amazing team of black artists and scholars. But immediately after the exhibition, the images were taken into the Library of Congress and put into storage. And even Du Bois was not able to get them out to do anything else with them. And in fact, they were sort of hidden there. I didn't know about these until a couple of years ago. This book is only from 2018. And it's only really with the digitization of the collection that this book has, uh, the, these images have come back into presence. And so we need to have this process, a willingness to engage with the technical material and the real material, the real human experience that the, the, that data shows us. And I hope through improving that process, we can move towards better world, whatever that means. And that is where I will finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, what a visionary ride through the world of mathematics. Thank you so much, Professor Harris. And uh, I'm going to turn over the uh, hosting to our fabulous Honors College ambassadors who are happy to help field the Q&A. So questions in the